Okay, so we're going to continue um, on with putting together a, um, a school program, no matter where you are, with the things that you want to think about. So let's talk now about building a relationship with school staff. And I know some of this stuff I may have touched on earlier. Um, I'm trying to conceptualize it a little bit more now. When I go into a school setting, any kind of school setting, I really want to make sure that I listen, listen, listen. And that's you know a very basic mental health principle. A lot of times, whether it's a parent or a professional that you're working with, as long as they feel heard, they're going to feel much better about the situation and what's going on. So we want to really put out there that you're listening, you're listening to them, what they have to say is important, even if what they're saying sometimes is mm, really off where you think the kid should be or whatnot, you have to validate it. And that, again, that's just good floor time. You have to validate their thoughts, their feelings, and their concerns and listen to them. So listen, observe, respect. You know, I was in a situation recently where um, it was a litigation between the school district and the parents, and um, some of the people in the school district were finding it challenging, some of the things that the parents were asking for. So I actually thought that some of the things that the parents were asking for were pretty valid, um, but I had to validate their experience up around that first and say, yes, I've been there, it, it can be very challenging, but let's think about how maybe we can do this little piece just to start. Um, so it, listening is important. Um, joining them where they are in their experience is important. Identify the strong points of the existing program and build on them. So again, not gonna go in with a bulldozer and just say this is how we're doing things now. Um, and for every school district or, or school program, you're gonna be able to do this with varying degrees of pacing. <laughs> Um, but really, you know, when you come in as somebody new and you start to really compliment, wow, I really like how you do that, or I really like how you have this set up. I mean, I was someplace recently where I'm like, I, I love that. Can I take a picture? <clears throat> I'm going to take that back and use it in my school. You know, starting out that way really helps to bring down the anxiety. They respect you as a colleague. Um, really, I can't say enough about how important that is to stay positive. Um, I was in a situation recently where as I started out, I was getting a lot of really aggressive questioning, um, and I, I actually used posturing, and I'm going to walk away from the mic for a second, um, but the person who kept firing these questions at me, I actually walked over to them and, you know, just listened, listened, validated, that's really a good point, and then gave them my point of view back, because I really wanted to just posturally and everything else saying, I hear you. I hear you, and what you have to say is important. I don't agree with anything you're saying. No, I'm just kidding, I didn't say it. But you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you that respect. And I'm gonna stay positive about it. Um, what goes on in your head? Nobody needs to know. <laughs> yeah, it's called filtering. Actually, I do. I have a great activity that I did so many years ago with this little boy, and it was a picture of two heads with bubbles or no, it was a picture of a head with a bubble and then a big brain. And I had these little cue cards of things that you might say and he had to determine, and they had pockets in them. Is it something you say or is it something you keep in your head? That was 15 years ago and we're still working on it with him, but. <laughs> so again, collaborate, don't dictate. Form a team, not a hierarchy. Use dialogue, um, use dialogue school staff can relate to and connect with. Don't overwhelm them with clinical jargon. So I had to learn this the hard way and quickly, and even at my own school. You can't go in, well, we're going to, you know, cerebellum, 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 and co-regulate, and um, reciprocal blah, 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 and the vestibular system, and the proprioceptive system, and um, it's, they'll just shut down. Um, a lot of times when I do school trainings, if I have the luxury of multiple sessions, I don't even go over the developmental levels in the beginning. I just start with the principles of DIR. Um, I talk a little bit about the principles. So in my school, this is how I kind of chunk it down. Just the principles, affect, go for the gleam in the eye, keep it going, don't take no for an answer. Okay, go try that. Let me show you lots of examples, go try that. Next time they come back, okay, let's talk a little bit about indi individual differences and how that impacts how the child's responding to you when you're using those principles. Show a lot of videos, examples, talk about it. Okay, go back and think about that. 
Next time they come, okay, now let's start looking at this in a developmental progression. You don't always have that luxury, but if you do, and you're looking at a program that you're building over time, maybe think about just giving it to them in those little tiny chunks. Because when you try to give them the whole big picture, like I did earlier, it might be too overwhelming. Oh, and I, <clears throat> I just put down here under the picture, tell me about Johnny and how you spend your time together. That's a big thing that I do too, just so you know, I don't go in with my idea about what kind of program I think this child should have, what kind of schedule. I want to hear about what they're already doing, and again, how can I build on that? So we spent a lot, a lot of time recently at a place that I was at doing that first. <clears throat> this is really for school personnel. Um, and I had to get one political picture in here. Um, but intimidation is not okay. So um, whether you're a school district or a parent, to really have kind of that bullying mentality breaks things down immediately. This us versus them never works in the best interest of the child. Listen to the parent, try to put yourself in their shoes. And if you're a parent, listen to the professional, try to put yourself in their shoes. So really you have to go in with a lot of psychology as your foundation for how you're gonna make this work. Because at the end of the day, it's all for the kid or the kids. And if it just becomes this power struggle between the adults, guess who gets lost in the middle? And a lot of times they hear all of this going on and that's not good either. Um, so we can learn from school staff. Um, so if we're going in and we're consulting as professionals, we really, again, have to listen to them because they can teach us new ways to approach the child. They can also help identify developmental weaknesses that can be targeted in DIR in both home and school. And sometimes this is a good way in. So just listening to what they're struggling with or having success with and, again, building off of that. And, you know, recently I watched some lovely videos of a kid I didn't know yet. I was going in to do some consultation. And... Um, there were a lot of great things in the video, and then there are some things I would have done really differently. But I didn't start with what I would do differently. I started with what they were doing right, and really, how did that relate to the DIR model? And I actually just left it at that for my first time. You know, as we build a relationship, then I can go back in and say, well, you know, now maybe let's expand on this and, and see where we can take it. So we want to use concrete examples to illustrate theory and bridge gap the gap between disciplines. So when we are doing this work, and I think I've given some concrete examples here, but concrete examples about the, either kids that you've worked with like the kids that they have or some of their children specifically, um, they need examples. You can't stay all in theory. Um, otherwise, again, they get lost. Support staff in small steps, make reality-based recommendations. So I think I kind of covered that um, already, but Again, when I'm consulting or I'm helping set something up, um, I'll really take a read of their program, of them, of their learning style, and what they're able to absorb when I'm with them, and then I will give them recommendations based on all of that between then and the next time. Um, because I wanna set them up for success. They're just like our students. <laughs> you know, If you give them too much and they fail, chances are they're not gonna do much of anything. It's same with IEP goals. If you have so many IEP goals for a child, and you work on a thousand things a day, they never really do well at one or two things. So keep that concept in mind. What's your experience when you recommend? Um, I work in schools and now um, doing in home based um, for intervention. I have come to parents to IPs and stuff. And when parents begin to make suggestions, and because that's part of our program, you know, teaching them that, yes, you are part of the IEP team and that you can suggest schools. My experience on behalf of the parents is the minute the parents begin to speak up, the school pushes back, right? You know, they, they don't like it. And they begin to belittle, you know, it's, it's so it's hard. I know I was in a situation like that recently and <clears throat> I think one of the things that I think about, and I'll tell you what I did in that situation, but that was like in the moment, is be proactive. So I think if you can work with your parent on goals that you feel you really want in there, get them to the district prior to the meeting, and maybe you, know, you present them as the professional who's worked with the parent in developing these, um, and let them know we're coming into this meeting 
with the parent as part of the team. This is what we've thought about. This is what we've put together. We really want to be collaborative here, but th this is what we'll be bringing to the table. Give them some time to process is, is very helpful because if they're not expecting it, they, sometimes they will be rigid. I had this experience recently, and that's why I said intimidation is not okay because um, I went in with a parent who's a friend of mine. Um, they didn't know who I was or that I had a school. They thought, you know, I was just some housewife coming to support, you know, this woman. And they just did this, that, you know, that really, well, we don't see that. He's fine here. We don't, you know, he has lots of friends, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I was boiling inside. It was all I could do. And I just said, well, you know, maybe we should listen to the parents. Sometimes parents can give us insight that we don't know in the school setting. But then I was able to listen to what they were saying and pull it back to what she was saying. So she was saying he was coming home, saying that he was depressed and he had no friends. He has friends here, he has lots of friends here. He, and then, okay, well, what kind of friends? Can you elaborate on that? Well, he, he's a 15-year-old boy. He sits with Susie in this class and he, he eats lunch with Catherine here and I see him with Catherine a couple times throughout the day. Okay, so how many 15-year-old boys do you know have only girls as friends? And then they were like, oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, trying to find those little ends, and I wasn't being negative about it. I wasn't saying you're wrong, but I'm saying think about it. You know, you're only seeing him maybe a couple times a week in these little flashes. Um, but if you really think about what's going on, is that true? And is it really meaningful? Um, so that's a way to try to bring those things together. And there's no easy answer because sometimes no matter what you do, you're going to have that relationship. But what you want to do is you want to try to stay calm. You know, you want to take the high road. You're not going to join them where they are and, you know, be jerks back because then it just gets, then it becomes a power struggle. You know, then it becomes I am going to win. But if you keep that gentle pushing and you're making sense with concrete examples, you know, um, that's the best you can do. And then if not, doesn't work, you go to litigation. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, you try, <laughs> you, you know, you try to also, again, it's the same thing, compliment them on certain things. We really like this goal. These are really good. We think these are gonna be extremely useful. We would just like to see this added. Um, it's all about building relationships. And you know what? It, sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, you do the best you can. Setting some preliminary goals, let's use the child's developmental profile, parent and staff concerns to develop the goals, so we want to be collaborative there. This may include the fusing of new DIR goals with the modification of existing IEP goals. These preliminary goals will guide both the training of the team and the structuring of the program. So training can take place in different modules. You can have just a brief overview, you can have a full day workshop, a multi-day workshop, program setup, set up, ongoing coaching and supervision. Um, I'm working with a couple of schools right now where I went and I did a full day. I did a day on the, the, the morning on the approach. I worked in the afternoon with actually the child and the team. We met for another hour afterwards, really solidified the goals that they were gonna work on. And then once a month we get online and they show me video of how things are going and we talk about um, where to go from there. Obviously face-to-face, -face, video feedback, phone consultation, other camp. We have a lot of staff who come to us um, either to celebrate the children's school or our, our DCCF summer camp to work and be trained. And fortunately, where I live, um, we have some school districts who actually send us regular ed teachers over the summer to work in our camp to learn and then go back and use that in their classrooms, which is awesome. And I'm going to show you some pictures of those mainstream classrooms in a few minutes. Um, so training should be an interdisciplinary team training and it should uh, occur prior to the start of the program when possible. Say if it's a new program, if it's not, obviously that's not going to happen. This should include everyone involved in the program, including the parents. Theory should include this. This is just kind of summarizing what I did before. The child's individual strengths, weaknesses, needs, and goals. The sensory, motor, visual uh, strengths and weaknesses. Communication, social, emotional, cognitive, and independence abilities. An understanding of how processing challenges, developmental profiles directly affect learning, socialization, behavior, and independence. Develop my, developmental milestones and how relationships are the vessel for fostering developmental principles and strategies of DIR. So 
ideally you would not do this in a one day training, but these are the things that over time you wanna be able to cover. And sometimes if it's a one day training or a two hour training, you gotta work with what you gotta work with. Clearly illustrate practice and principles, again, using concrete examples. If I would have just done that pre-overview this morning with no video, no examples, it would have been very hard for new people to DIR and people you know, working in regular education to even grasp what I was talking about. Provide examples of principles to be used in the classroom at each developmental level, which I think I did. Give, um, actually I didn't do the principles, I just really talked more about the levels, but if I was doing a training, we would go and break down videos like that at each level and really talk about the principles. Give clear examples of how to target the child's individual goals. So recently in, in something that I did, I only gave them, I wanna say three or four floor time goals, that's it. So I wrote the goal, I wrote it measurable, I gave, and then I gave examples of what that looks like, and then I elaborated on, remember when we did this and he did that, that's what we're after. So just really kept it to three and gave them lots of examples very specific to that child. If it's a classroom that you're consulting to, maybe you do that with a couple kids so that they can um, generalize across different individuals. Provide opportunities for the teacher to observe the trainer working with the child. This could be done in the home or in the educational setting, seeing as believing. So, um, you know, as much as we don't like it, maybe sometimes, and I just did this recently where I'm working with a child and there's 20 people sitting around, it feels awkward um, for me and for the child. But, um, you know, often you have to start there and them seeing you do the work and making mistakes brings down the anxiety, gives a whole new level of respect versus just giving these recommendations and you're never even interacting with the child. Break down, <laughs> break down concepts, keep it simple, give positive feedback and build confidence. So again, in these little baby steps, and again, I'm thinking about videos I just watched recently. That's great, I loved that. Did you see the gleam in the eye when you did that? That was perfect, your pacing was so much better this time, awesome. Even if there's maybe 10 things I would like to see done differently, maybe I'll say one thing. But I wanna, you gotta keep them feeling good about what they're doing and building their confidence. Cause this is hard, this is hard for educators to take this on. Consistently refer to the principles and strategies and how they relate to what you're doing with the child. Um, <clears throat> I didn't put it in your handouts actually, but I have, um, you can email me for it, and it's probably on our site somewhere, but something called a floor time reflection sheet. It's a one pager of reflective questions that you ask yourself when you do floor time. So, did I get the gleam in the eye? How did I do it? How did I support the sensory? You know, things like that. And um, so asking those repetitive questions around doing the work sometimes helps them remembering that. No, nope, that's a data sheet. Yeah, I'll, I'll just have to. Um, you could just email Perfectum and ask for the floor time reflection sheet and I'll get the email. Be sure to explain developmental areas being targeted throughout interactions so that staff can make the connection that there are specific developmental areas and that this is not just playtime. So the video that I showed of the guy bouncing off the pillow, you know, I would really explain to staff that Okay, he was being really, really intentional, and that's what we were after, and as that intentionality grew, we wanted to see how we could get him to be more and more intentional, so we made it a little harder each time, and to where he was then starting to sequence some steps to solve this problem, which bumped him up to the next developmental level, so really breaking that down so they can understand. Encourage the teacher to get down on the floor with you and work at the child's de developmental level. Be positive and point out his or her strengths in working with the child, help staff reflect on his or her own experience with the child that relate to the principles and goals, and expand on staff's ideas and observations of the child. So recently in doing some of this work with, I, I um, was working with the teacher face to face and then later just giving some feedback on video, you know, I asked her, how did she feel about it? How did that feel? Um, I didn't just slam right into the recommendations, but I wanted to see if I could pull out from her what are some of the principles that you felt worked? Um, and that's just training in general, even for my own staff. I mean, if we're constantly just telling them, telling them, telling them, they're gonna always be waiting for you to tell them, tell them, tell them. You know, we wanna really give them questions. So what principles do you felt worked there? What felt challenging? What level did you feel, you know, the level again comes later, but when you're there, what level do you think you were working at? 
Do you think he was ready for you to push him up to the next level? Okay, if so, how? But that gets, you know, that's a couple months into training. Encourage creativity, affect, and the ability to think on your feet when we are trying to establish an emotional connection. Stress and provide the understanding that every person establishes his or her own unique connection with the child. Everyone brings something different to the table. So this is something, the first statement really is, is about, this is not a prescription. This is not um, like some approaches where there's something that you say and you're looking for a certain answer. It's hard. That's what makes floor time so hard and why some school districts don't want to embrace it because it takes a lot of support. You have to be thinking on your feet constantly and there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and that is really, I, I think, really one of the hardest things. Um, when you're thinking about all those principles floating around in your head and you're really thinking about making that emotional connection with the child, what should I be using now? What should I be doing now? But after you do it enough times, it starts to become something that, that, that becomes automatic. But initially, it feels really awkward. But this, you know, the own unique connection, this is something else that I really want to stress. And doing co consultation recently with an interdisciplinary team, what the speech therapist was doing with the child looked very different than what the academic teacher was doing with the child, but they were still using principles and they were still both doing a good job. You know, maybe the kid liked one person a little bit more than the other person. I'm not going to point that out. Um, and I'm not going to say, well, we should do it like she does it because he responded better. I want to be very careful to really respect each person's uh, different connection and how that works. And his personalities too. I mean, you might have somebody who's really oh, affective and ushy-gushy and then you might have a teacher, I'm not trying to categorize teachers, but who's maybe a little more teaching, you know? Let's go here, let's do this. You're not gonna change people's personalities. You can encourage them to use the principles, but you've gotta work with and respect, you know, their personality as well. Be sure to point out past mistakes you've made while working with a child. Even those who have a great deal of training and experience with this approach still make mistakes. Our children teach us something new every day. I talk a lot in training about how, you know, I don't want to say trial and error and just make it sound so random, but, you know, floor time is. You know, you've got to find the right pacing with the child, um, the right rhythm, the right level of challenge. Sometimes you go too high and you lose them. Sometimes you go too low and they're bored, you know. Provide tons of resources um, so that they have things that they can go back and, and hopefully, and, you know, encouraging initiative and self-learning. Speak with the team about regular meetings to discuss progress. Um, often this is difficult due to the amount of professionals involved in scheduling conflicts, so I know we could have a long discussion about this as well. I recognize it as a problem. A lot of schools don't have a lot of extra time out of con outside of contracted hours, so we have to be really um, creative here. One of the things I love, create a communication tool. I love Google Docs and Google Classroom and how that's allowing people to collaborate online when they can. So maybe setting up some type of collaborative document where you can put notes um, about a, a student and everybody's contributing and being able to read each other's. I mean, I know certain things are confidential and whatnot, but um, if you can't meet on a regular basis or you maybe are only able to meet every couple of months, at least you can have regular communication through something like this. Google Classroom just came out in August, and it is actually more of a tool for teachers to use with their classroom, but there is some parent interface there as well. It's very much like Google Docs, but it's more encompassing, I don't know, it's like a Google Circle group for your classroom. So you've got assignments there, you've got notes, but it's very interactive. Um, but for like, say you have, uh, you're doing training and you've got goals. We actually use Google Forms now for our data sheets. So um, I can actually go on a shared data sheet and look at how it's going with a particular child. Um, so there's just different ways. I mean, I don't want to keep going into that, but different ways to use collaborative documents that people are shared on to be able to share communication. I mean, nothing beats a team meeting, but I'm just being realistic and make yourself available. So if you're the consultant and people are having questions, you wanna make sure that you're responding as quickly as you can, but you also have to set boundaries. I mean, if you're consulting and somebody's emailing you five times a day, you know, put all your thoughts together and, and jot me one email you know, at the end of the week. 
Be sure to consistently discuss the developmental areas being targeted as you reflect on the student's progress. So be careful that academic and skill-based progress doesn't mask developmental needs. So a lot of times I'll be, you know, we, we've got a pro program going now and I'll say, how is it going? And they might fall back on, well, you know, he's, he's really improving in his math or he's really improving in, you know, again, bumping back, you know, he's becoming so much more independent putting his lunch away. That's fantastic and that's probably being fueled by the developmental work that we're doing, but let's stay focused on the developmental goals. Understanding that integrating a new approach is different, especially for educators who have been teaching for years. Change is not always embraced. Be patient and be sure to provide information and hands-on training to support the approach. Be careful not to go too fast. Tailor your interactions to their individual uh, differences and needs. I think we've talked a lot about this. Stressing a team approach. Building a house takes a variety of specialists, all very important to creating a solid foundation. And this, I think, is hopefully my last training slide, is the biggest challenge in, is the shift to thinking developmentally and understanding that academics need strong social, emotional, and cognitive foundations to build upon. And I just kind of made a new little, sometimes I use a flow chart that mixes DIR developmental language with more language that school districts might use. So you can be creative and do this any way that you want, but sometimes these kind of visuals are very helpful. So these are just visuals to support staff. Um, so these are different classrooms. This, these are all actually all in public schools. So this is just a DIR wall. It has um, some principles on there, um, some reminders for people. These are DIR goals of students. So just a few key goals uh, for the kids so that when all of the staff are doing floor time or interacting, they can be reminded what's my focus. And then just little things around the school. Challenge the child to expand on ideas. Use affect to support the child's ability to sustain an interaction. Think of sense of self and self-esteem. So staff need reminders. Um, we're gonna get to some student visuals in a second, but just keep in mind that staff need reminders. So in structuring your program, we've talked a little bit about this, and I think I don't, everybody sitting here seems to already be on the same page about making sure that it's go they're going to experience success and reduce anxiety and, and really maximize that sense of self. The program should take into account the child's individual profile and passions and be meaningful, motivating, experience-based, multi-sensory, stimulating, challenging, and at the student's level. So stimulating and challenging at the student's level is a really important one. I think after being here this weekend and seeing us so much talk about kids who don't have verbal communication or verbal language, what they're really capable of and that they do need to be exposed to higher level content even if they're not able to show you um, how they're processing it. So I see a lot of kids, particularly as they start to get older, become bored because they're not getting enough rich content. But then I also see some kids, like we talked about earlier, who maybe are exposed to things that are, they're not ready for yet. So really trying to look at that just right level. And obviously DIR goals and principles should be um, in every aspect of the program. We want to make learning dynamic, so in thinking about what the child is doing, and I could do a whole nother day just on doing academics in a, in a DIR way, we really want to minimize concrete teacher-led activities that require copying a model, following steps, worksheets, etc., and really encourage original ideas, creativity, expanding on ideas. So again, I'm just kind of throwing this in here right now. This really does require another webcast, which um, we, we do have an education certification track that's going to really have a lot of video examples and how-tos around just making learning DIR. But what I will say is, again, if your, child in, in, if your child in the school or somebody that you're consulting to, their individual profile, they need help with tracking, they need help with movement, they need help with motor planning, and they're always sitting at a desk just doing worksheets you got to put two and two together there. Um, and the little boy that I showed yesterday was a perfect example. You know, he never looked up from the table at 14. So that was a problem for him in a huge developmental way. So we've talked a lot about, you know, what the classroom considerations should be. The use of space. I just wanted to show you some pictures right now. And again, you're not going to go into a public school and have them change what their classrooms look like. But I'll just give you some 
visuals here that, you know, in a good floor time classroom, obviously this is a preschool room, you're going to have tons of toys and symbolic play toys, things that they can relate to. A school bus, you know, some of the first symbolic play is getting on the school bus and going to school and doing circle time. You know, the kids can relate to that and, oh, and this, and you name all the kids in the classroom, and you can see them make that connection. Oh my gosh, you know, and, and so really think about what, um, and obviously age appropriate, this is a preschool classroom. You know, your circle time area. I love this picture. The teacher has lots of motor and sensory um, equipment. It's all kind of just neatly jammed in one area, but it's in the classroom. This is in public school fourth and fifth grade classrooms where they have sensory centers that all kids can get up and use. Um, a place for a break and to recharge. Our kids need that. Um, this is obviously for a younger class, but even for my older classes. I see teachers who have a corner where there's a couple bean bags and headphones and some books. And kids, you know, people with autism will tell you that it takes so much energy to process and perform that if they can just get away for five minutes or ten minutes and just recharge that battery and come back, they're so much better. And we really, really need to respect that. Um, that would be like us being at work and never getting a break all day long to even go to the bathroom. I mean, it just doesn't work. These are just some interesting visuals. I don't think I need to teach you about visuals, but when working with, you know, consulting to a school, a regular school district, they may not know how powerful visuals are for our kids, so we do like to give examples. So thinking about our staff, um, we want all of, our, all of the staff, ideally, to be facilitating DIR goals. Again, doesn't always happen. But it would be fabulous if, and that's why you only want to give two or three goals at a time, because if you want the PE teacher and the floor time or the paraprofessional and the teacher, they've got a million other responsibilities as well. They're only going to be able to hold on to a couple. Um, but I think that the idea about this is don't just leave it up to the personal aid and try to stress that with your team because a lot of times that is what happens. So we've started this DIR program for a child in a school and the teacher's like, well, he's just with his aide all day, so I'll let her do that. You really wanna stress how critical it is. Even if it's just the teacher's teaching the class all day and when she asks the child a question, she doesn't just settle for one circle of interaction, but she gets a couple back and forth just to think about that engagement or how could she add something you know meaningful to the child and get that gleam in the eye just little things like that the child must learn to relate to a range of staff and peers there should be a key case manager to ensure consistency and intensity this could be a teacher a school psychologist um, but for an older student that I was helping with recently, that IEP that I went to, I mean, he's moving around a typical high school, and who's watching out for any of this? So we really had to establish that point person, and I'll talk about when we get to the IEP in a minute, we had to put down how many times a week, you know, when would be the times that she would be watching on, you know, him, so, um, and communication obviously is crucial. Materials should be varied to support the improvement of processing abilities. Um, I don't know, I'm probably getting too specific here, but say you're, you're consulting to a classroom where they've got a lot of young children and you see that they've got a lot of those electronic push button toys and the kids, you know, in their playtime, you know, that's not promoting regulation, engagement, intentionality. So just think about that. That's really all I'm saying here is make sure that there are um, sensory, motor, symbolic, things that are gonna be, you can use to promote development. Just having puzzles and light up toys is gonna really limit you. Um, visual supports and modifications should be kept organized. So basically all I'm saying here are things need to be kept neat, organized, and accessible to the whole team. I know to people listening to this, that's, that's an obvious, but when you're get, doing this training, it is something that needs to be established. How is this going to be done? Because say a parent buys all of these floor time toys to be used in this program, and then one person uses them and just scatters them about the school, and now the next person can't find them. I mean, the, just little things like that really become frustrating in the process. Make every minute count when you're thinking about a child's schedule, so don't schedule act activities for the child that are de developmentally inappropriate. Um, so, you know, for example, a child who has very poor regulation or inability to engage, you're not going to sit him in a 45-minute circle time. It's just a waste of his time. Um, 
And I talked about this recently with the little guy that I was consulting to at the school, and they were actually relieved to know that they didn't have to force him into certain structured activities because he wasn't ready for it yet. But what is he doing when he's not doing that? You've got to make sure that there's floor time and other developmentally appropriate things going on. Considering processing abilities in the different environments, so when you're thinking about the schedule, again, if the kid's not ready for the giant gym class, maybe he gets OT or PT during that time until he's ready. So just really thinking about that individualization of that. And this is just saying make sure that the, the, the schedule overall fosters development. We talked a little bit about this flow chart. Um, you want to think about how much one-to-one, -one, small group, large group. Routine is important. And what you were saying earlier, minimizing transitions to reduce anxiety and, and maximize feelings of competency. When a kid's ready, they feel good and proud about changing classes and having a locker and everything. But until they're ready, so fragmenting. And Greenspan used to say, don't fragment a kid who's already fragmented. And that's an important statement. Set up specials to be um, successful. This is something that sometimes falls through the cracks. Um, we have a really good classroom program, but then the kid has art and music and PE, and there are no supports there, so we want to think about that. And we want to think about peer involvement when the child is ready as well. I'm not going to go through this. It's here for you on your handouts. It's a sample schedule. Um, for a half-day self-contained classroom, half-day inclusion, just to show how we might think about structuring time to get that DIR piece in there, as well as getting some mainstream time, supported mainstream time. So developing an IEP. So this is really now going to be pulling all of this together. We do it with a team, as we've said a million times. This includes the parents. So you want to clearly define your DIR goals as they relate to each level. We want to include specific strategies and principles for facilitating these goals. Um, clearly identify the involvement and responsibility of each staff member. This is really important. Um, so many times we come up with the greatest IEP goals and the greatest IEP, but there's no accountability anywhere. So it doesn't happen. Um, we really want to say if we've got DIR and we're going to have, you know, we want the DIR principles to really be targeted throughout the day and we can list by which people, but we're going to have one-on-one -on -one intensive floor time for an hour a day with the psychologist or with the paraprofessional. We want to say where it's going to happen, we're going to say what materials are going to be used, and I know it sounds like really petty, but this is how you help people stay accountable. Clearly define all modifications and supports to be used with the child. So again, this, if this is in writing, and, and I know all states have different IEPs. In New Jersey, we have, um, we have the IEP goals. We um, can talk about the schedule of the day, but then we have a separate modifications page. And it's really a checklist, and you can check which modifications the child gets, but we can also add to the modifications. Um, so again, in this, situation where I was recently where the district was really pushing back. Oh yes, we'll do that. Oh yes, we'll use that modification. Oh yes, we'll give him extra time. Oh, okay, we're going to list all of these things on the modification page because once it's listed there, they're held accountable for it. Define sensory motor and visual supports. Make sure your t terminology identifies the intensity and consistency of supports. Define how facilitated peer interactions will be supported. So it's not just, well, we're gonna put them in the mainstream for these specials or for a recess, but how is that gonna be facilitated by who, um, what's gonna happen during that time. You know, it could be where you're <coughs> setting up lunch bunch a couple of times with a psychologist in a regular high school for a kid. Identify the structure and frequency of team meetings and communication requirements, and clearly define training and consult consultation agreements. So before we go into um, talking a little bit about specific DIR goals, um, and we'll still save the question of changing minds to the end, because that's, that's the biggie, but anything so far on that, or anything since you all sound like you're experts um, that you feel might have been left out? You're good? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about goals. Um, how many of you are able to actually get any kind of DIR goals into IEPs or individualized goals? Eh, we've got a hand and an eh. 
Um, you know, these are going to be very DIR worded goals that I'm going to show you, but sometimes it's just a matter of semantics. So you can take um, the word en engagement and call it attention, but then your um, examples are going to be much more around engagement. Um, so I've had people who just are not able to get DIR goals into the um, IEP, so they do the best they can to use wording that will be accepted but mean the same thing. So I talked to some of you on the break. If you go on the Perfectum website and you go on the educator's corner, there is a sample DIR goal bank that has many more goals at each developmental level. We have been working for years on a comprehensive DIR goal bank that, I know I'm going to date this webcast by saying this, but we hope to have out in the next year or so. that will be much more comprehensive. Um, but within these goals, there are a range of of levels at each goal, so maybe a child who's just starting to emerge into this goal, all the way up to a kid who's working pretty robustly at that level. And we also have subcategories for each level. Um, so for example, engagement, we might have engagement one-on-one, -on -one, engagement in the classroom, engagement with peers, that type of thing. Um, I'm not going to get so specific about the school bank here. Okay, so I was just seeing what, how I put this together. So some example level one goals. Um, I'm not going to read all of these word for word, but you, know, you really want to think about, so for the first one, the child's ability to maintain self-regulation. And here I define that, a calm and organized state and, and attention, so I added that word for them, and a non-demanding, non-stimulating activity for at least blank minutes, blank times per day. So we're going to look at this video again of this little boy, John Luke, in a second, the one that I was bouncing in the hallway, and we're going to really think about what specific goals would have related to that um, floor time. Um, the second goal, which is really, really wordy, and there's no other way to do it than this, is really thinking about the different processing systems. So if we have a kid who is being very visually overwhelmed, um, I'm going to write a goal like this that talks about how can we help him with that visual perceptual processing. How can we, within our floor time, within what we're doing, support his visual system, but also help him learn how to tolerate it a little bit more. So if you remember the boy in the case yesterday, um, and I'll have to explain it for the webcast, but you know, he was always wiggling his toys in front of his face because he just couldn't tolerate what was going on out here. So we did a lot of work with him and kind of bringing those toys up and around and then eventually starting to move them more and then eventually starting to move him with them more. And what was, that was doing was helping his visual system start to be able to tolerate processing all this different information, but while he was having fun. And the more he, he did that, even through a period of two weeks, he stopped being so overwhelmed and, and shutting out. So that's something that can, can be done. And you could write this, these goals are just examples, but you could write a goal like this for anything. You know, you might have a child who has movement issues and doesn't like to move, um, likes to lay on the floor a lot or likes to be glued to a seat. You know, how can you write a goal about helping him with movement? And, you know, you might not even put like, vestibular in there or anything, but just, you know, how, how can you, he process movement better? So these are really thinking about level one goals. Level two goals, um, you can use the word eye gaze or even eye contact if that's what they're going to require, even though we know developmentally that's not necessarily what we're after. Um, so thinking about how, how are we getting a child to reference us socially. Because in a school setting, again, a kid could be attending to their work and never looking at anyone. I can't tell you how many videos I've seen where the kid seems really, really engaged, but there's ne never, you know, he's reaching for the next piece of the puzzle to the teeth. There's never a single acknowledgement that there's even that person next to me doing this. Um, and I did see a video like that recently, and it's like, that is great, he's doing the task. And they were really happy. Wow, look how focused he is. He's finally doing tabletop tasks. And that is great. That is great, and, I, and I, again, that's really impressive. Now let's see if we can get him to do that and share that moment with you. Um, so going for that gleam in the eye, um, that's another big one, helping people to think about affect. So this next one, you know, 
improving its ability to sustain a rhythmic back and forth with someone else. That's not something that people in an educational system are typically thinking about, um, but we do have to, as part of our training, help them to understand that our kids have a lot of issues with rhythm and timing, especially in a school setting where their capacities are being broken down. So um, to have this as a goal where, and sometimes, you know, again, a teacher has a million different things that they're thinking about, including standardized testing and everything else. They're not gonna necessarily embrace DIR and learn every piece of our vernacular. But if you can impart upon them, listen, our goal is to, every time we interact with him, see if we can get a back and forth exchange of three or four back and forths versus just one. Um, something like that a teacher can do. You know, in circle time I had this lovely video of being in a circle time and the teacher, she's using whatever she can that's motivating and for whatever reason she had, um, Pepsi, and I don't know if it was because this kid was motivated, I don't know why, it's, it wasn't doing discrete trials, I promise you, it wasn't reinforcing with food. But what I remember, and this was back in 2000, so I don't remember it exactly, but I remember she was going around the kids and she was doing more and less. So um, she said, but she was also thinking about the circles back and forth, so she says to this little boy, would you like some soda? And he said, yes. Would you like more or less? And he said less, so she poured him a little tiny bit and she gave it to him and he looked at it and he, more. And she said, okay, she gave him more. He took it, he drank it, and he had like this really weird face. But you know, that was nice because she was using a couple different concepts. She was t thinking about a meaningful teaching of a concept, but she was also going back and forth with the child. So a very teacher friendly thing to do. And it could be that this child would have a goal of sustaining back and forth circles. Um, so we talk about having, you know, doing things with familiar peers and then we bump it up to non-familiar peers, longer amounts of time. You can just, for those of you who are familiar with IEP goals, you know how to tweak these. Um, for level three goals, it could be something as simple as leading an adult by a hand to initiate something. So we're really thinking about initiation here. Um, we're also thinking about the child's range of affect to be intentional. So again, do we have the kid who is always being prompted to raise his hand or being prompted to join an activity? Or do we have the kid who's really, my turn, my turn, I wanna do it, even if they're not verbally saying that. That's a big one at this level three, really looking at that ability to be intentional and to communicate that, not constantly sitting and waiting. I mean, the boy that I had over the summer that I showed yesterday, I mean, he was literally waiting for permission to make every single move. And you see that with kids who have been over-prompted and doing, even if they're doing a stupid worksheet, um, they do one and then they look at you for good job, okay, keep going. It's like, no, you know, you can do this, you can take the lead on this, you can be intentional. You know what I use for that? Yeah, what I use for that now is um, I've had the luxury of seeing kids from two to three all the way up to 25, and we're really discovering that as kids become young adults, it's the executive functioning that is the problem. So they can be warm and related and creative and very deep thinkers, but it's that, what do I do now in the moment, or what do I not do now in the moment, sometimes is the bigger problem. Um, so I tell teachers and parents and everybody who's involved in the process that um, executive functioning starts at a very basic level of how we are using maybe cueing versus prompting. And I actually learned a lot of the principles of this through RDI. I don't know if anybody's familiar with RDI approach, but rather than saying, you know, in DIR, we tend to like to scaffold. What's gonna happen next? What is he gonna do? How is he feeling? And in the beginning stages, kids need that because they have no idea where to go. But once they gain a little bit of ability, we stop with the questions and we use pauses or we use a statement for a child to then have to 
build on. So that's another premise also of using FC. So if any of you are trained in facilitated communication, you do ask some questions, but a lot of what you're doing is validate what was the last thing said or done and leave that expectation for them to build on it. Um, and I think that, and also just minimizing the language. This is something else I tell teachers. So I don't know, I'm gonna use a very simple example because it's in my head right now, but they needed to move the tables or desks for lunchtime. They were gonna put them all together. The teacher just walked over and the child was sitting right there and grabbed the side of a desk and just looked at the child. Didn't say anything, didn't say help me. And then the child didn't do anything and she kind of jiggled the thing. And all of a sudden he kind of looks. You want that light bulb to go off. Oh, something needs to happen here, what is it? And for kids who have really severe motor planning issues, they may know what it is and need a little help. And in that case, once you see their eyes go to what they need to do, then you can maybe give them a gentle little, if, if you need to. But I prefer, would prefer to wait if you can. Um, but I would just, I know that was a long answer. I would really talk about it in the context of the long term and how these are, this is at the root of executive functioning. Realizing something needs to happen, that little light bulb going off, what is it? Let me try it. And when you are working on intentionality for a kid who's not intentional at all, this is something you really have to cue teachers in as well, there's no right or wrong answer. So if, they, if their goal is they're not intentional at all and suddenly they're being intentional, even if they give you the wrong answer, it's the right answer for now, yay. <laughs> you know, not to crush that. Uh, my question is, like in that same game, that um, when do you give, for my situation, it's a bridge builder. And how do we create bridges? It's not so much just appraising them, it's really helping them think fall into a gap and noticing you know how to get the bridge for the executive function piece. And what I I've tried very hard, teachers are not either aware of it or they feel like it's not their problem. Like it's not an issue that they need to address with the motor planning kids, like you're saying. They're breaking down and they're doing the work, but they're not noticing what's going to happen next. And I think that's what I said earlier when I said the biggest shift is to get teachers and educators or people in the educational system <clears throat> to think developmentally. And unfortunately, and again, this is reality and we have to be respectful of this, you've got your common core standards, which I actually think are good, and then you've got your standardized testing, which I don't think is so great, um, and teachers are forced to keep up a pace of teaching to the test. So they do get into this, and it's not always necessarily just their mentality or their unwillingness to be more developmental, it's their own anxieties over, I'm not gonna get rehired next year if my test scores aren't good. <clears throat> so I think it's first helping them to understand that these things aren't completely separate from each other, and how do, does working on the ability for a child to be more intentional meet some of what they're gonna need to do, even in the standardized testing? I mean, then they can start to, um, I think, appreciate it is not something, this other thing that you're giving me to do. Because I'm an administrator of my own school, and believe me, every time I bring in something new I want my teachers to do, I'm just visioning myself right now at a teacher's meeting on a Tuesday afternoon, 3 o'clock, and I say, you know, we really want to bring in... Um, visual spatial work and we're going to get trained in it and it's going to really you can just see the eyes going oh my god you know and that's in a dir school so i do understand um, that teachers are are plate spinners elizabeth doolin in another dir school you know uses that terminology a lot and we have to be very careful about how things are perceived as this other whole thing versus how can we connect it to what they're already being required to do so let's look at this video one more time um, of in the hallway. We won't look at the whole thing because um, I personally have seen it about 5,000 times. Um, but if we think of the you know level one goal, a level two goal, and a level three goal. So say at level one, um, is he able to maintain some regulation in a non-demanding, non-overstimulating activity for let's say three minutes. I'm thinking about the video here. You know, is he able to use eye contact as a as a, or gaze as a means of engaging with the adult? And is there a gleam in the eye? We won't use the first one. Um, doo -doo -doo, range of affect. Impro will he improve the ability to independently use a range of purposeful gestures? Um, 
and the ability to initiate with an adult. So we've seen it already. <laughs> um, so was he able to sustain some level of regulation in this non-demanding activity? He was, not initially in the beginning when she was distracting him, I would say he was e very easily dysregulated, but throughout that process he was. So if I, was, if I had this on my little data sheet and I had that floor time session that day and we had these nice moments where he was really, I would have given him a plus for that. Um, was he using eye, gain, eye gaze to share this activity with me? In the beginning, again, well, yeah, I mean, he was, he learned the power of it throughout. So again, yes, I, I would say that he was sharing that moment with me, which this is more about. And was there a gleam in his eye? Yeah, so there, so I was, you know, these were the things I was thinking about when I was with him. Is he regulated? Is he sharing this moment with me at level two? Is there a nice gleam in the eye? Is he robustly engaged? That was really all I was thinking about. And it does, the next goal here talks about rhythm and timing. And there was, there was towards the end a nice rhythmic back and forth um, with him. And at level three, was he able to, um, we'll say if we had one, to say to use eye gaze to be intentional. He was, at the end, he was looking at me every time to get that to going. And then by the end, was he able to use a purposeful gesture to keep the activity going? Yeah, he was using his body. So that would be considered a gesture that we could eventually shape. And you can divine, define your gestures any way you want. Um, but remembering that developmentally gestural communication has to come before verbal communication, which is why when she was asking him to say, go, 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 even if he could say go, which you know I think he could maybe approximate, there was no gestural communication, not even using his eyes yet. So we have to stay developmental there. So these were the goals I actually had for him. I forgot I did this. So the child will increase ab ability to maintain self-regulation, calm and organized state, and attention in a non-demanding, overstimulating activity for 10 minutes, 10 times per day. So I was after this 10 times a day. I mean, ideally you would want it even more. So he, will he use eye gaze as a means of engaging with an adult at least five times per session? He did it more than five times there. Will he sustain gleam in the eye and enjoyment for, for interacting with adults for at least 10 minutes, five times a day? If you saw the whole clip, he did do it for 10, over 10 minutes. And in fact, I then put him down and he followed me to, to continue it again, which was you know, level four, really problem solving and um, being very intentional. Will he improve the ability to independently use a range of gestures? So, boy. I didn't even know I had this here, and I pulled the right ones. <laughs> um, so level four here, we're looking at improving motor planning abilities as it relates to executing ideas. And I put physically. I'm really breaking this down because people in the education system, you know, what does problem solving mean to them? So you know, I do break these down um, to be able to physically execute a sequence of five motor actions. So you know, I'm going to set up, and, and even if it's structured, who cares? I'm going to set up a motivating, fun activity where there are four things this child has to do in order to get what he wants. Um, it could be something like um, 
you know, to get to his favorite toy. I'm just putting pillows in the way, or I've turned some chairs upside down, or, you know, once he gets to the box of toys, it's locked and he's got to figure out how to open it. I mean, just, it could be anything, but we're sequencing these different steps and we're bumping up how long now the child is able to stay engaged and intentional. Um, yep. Sometimes staff and teachers are doing too much for the child to their detriment. What would that look like in a goal <laughs> that's respectful yet pragmatic? And maybe that's something. Yeah, no, I think it would come here. Actually, I, I wouldn't even think about it at levels three and four. So at level three, I would use wording like um, the child self initiates. Um, and I would maybe do it around specific activities in the beginning so that the staff can connect to it. And then once that's established, make it a more general goal. Um, but, you know, he's at lunchtime, you know, Johnny initiates getting his own lunchbox with no prompting or something like that. And then I would put as my examples, you know, if having trouble, the teacher might say, wow, Johnny's, you know, or, or Susie's lunch looks good. Mmm, sure I am hungry or whatever, but they're not directly prompting. You might have to give them alternatives to their typical prompting. Well, even without prompting, I mean, I think that's fair. It's that he, will, he or she will initiate on their own or self-initiate without prompting. Right. And you can take... Or less or minimal prompting. <coughs> right. And you can even break it down so far to say if you want to wean them off their prompting. Um, with physical prompting only, no verbal, and then with no prompt. You know what I mean? They may not be able to. The verbal prompting is the first thing that's got to go. And then um, maybe it's just gestural prompting or even a visual. So if a kid's super prompt dependent, they may not be able to go from all this prompting to just doing it on their own. So a lot of times I'll tell um, people they get really hooked and they almost are looking to co-regulate through somebody's verbal, constant verbal prompting. Um, so to replace that with a, a visual, whether it be a picture or even a word, and then eventually to be able to pull that off. And then what you want to eventually get to is if the child needs it, is to use natural cueing. Oh, yeah, no words, just affect and natural cueing. So level five goals, we're looking at, at the child's ability to have their own ideas and elaborate on ideas. Um, I also wrote in here, describe mental Im images. I don't know if you're familiar with the Visualize and Verbalize program, the Linda Mood Bell program, um, but that's a great one for helping kids to visual verbalize mental images, whether it's verbalizing or using an augmentative device to be able to describe mental images. But at level five, in order to be able to have your own ideas, you have to be able to hold a picture in your mind that's, that's feeding the idea, and some of our kids don't do that naturally. That's where they have all of the anxiety over schedules and, and time and everything else because they're not able to kind of visualize the sequence of what's going to happen next. Or even if mom's not here, she's still somewhere. Um, so this is an important level. So it could be something where you're even in circle time working on that ability to describe an image. And some of the principles of visualize and verbalize are, are really cool. And I, the same teacher that did the Pepsi thing I just told you about um, she would hold some kind of cool toy and talk about, oh, it's red and it's fuzzy and it's soft and it smells good. And then she would put it away and she would ask the kids, you know, what did it look like? What color was it? What did it feel? And so they had to kind of hold that picture in their mind and think about it. And that was a nice kind of precursor to then getting down and doing symbolic play with them where she did have all the kids, you know, at their homes and then the bus went around and picked them up and then they came into the school and they did circle time, you know, so really layering um, that, that, those symbolic abilities. And for older kids, you would do the same types of things, just around more age appropriate. Level six, this is really answering some WA quest, H questions, being able to give reasons behind your ideas. Um, these are higher level six, you know, using reasoning to be able to accept change and disappointment. Um, I mean, this could be something like um, a child who does get anxious about his schedule. 
you know, once he starts to have abilities at level six, if the speech therapist is 10 minutes late, rather than be speech, time for speech, time for speech, he can be thinking, well, maybe she's out today. Maybe she went to the bathroom. Maybe she's coming, you know, whatever. But he has some ability to put some reasoning behind that concept. But if he doesn't have that ability, he's going to be very, very anxious. Um, there's a lot in here about uh, pretend play, um, connecting ideas. So I'm just worried about my time. Do you want to see one quick video on this lo these levels? Okay. And then I do have the slide afterwards and we'll talk about which goals were being worked on. So this was a super smart girl, but she couldn't e she didn't have confidence in herself to use her ideas, so she couldn't even give names to the characters, even to get the play started. I suggested a structured game she could do it because the rules and ideas were already there. she had one idea she started to be able to have more ideas <coughs> I was thinking as I was watching this there's another video I would have liked to have used as well where I have a young man an older young man in a classroom doing an actual academic activity where he was being required to come up with ideas he came up with a very scripted idea but it was supposed to be three ideas if you had three wishes what would you do he came up with one and then he wanted to put the same one for each one had a complete meltdown and then we have him in a floor time scene where it's a similar thing but it was very passionate about um, the little mermaid 
and we had a girl that he liked being the Ariel, and they played it out, and we put all of these problems in there, and he had to come up with all of these ideas just to show how, <coughs> excuse me, working on the ability to have these ideas supports the ability in the academics. So just to make that connection for you, because sometimes people might say, well, why are you just playing? She can't have the simplest ideas within this play. How the heck? This is the girl that I was saying couldn't initiate the owl. And this is a child who was testing at college level academics in fifth grade once she got there. So she's brilliant, but developmentally she did not have these capacities to support that. So in thinking about what I was thinking about here, the child will improve the ability to string together 30 plus well-regulated circles of interaction in a shared problem solving way while maintaining a high level of engagement and intentionality. She was iffy there. Um, she almost had a meltdown a couple of times. She will increase the ability to express her ideas 10 times a day, or you could put you know, three times per floor time session. She really only did two. She had to do eeny, meeny, miny, mo to get the person who was gonna help with the broken leg. Then she came up with cream, and then what kind of band-aid, which was even kind of a borrowed idea. So that was an iffy one there. Um, she'll expand on ideas when prompted. I don't think she was really elaborating on ideas too much. Um, express two ideas in play and bridge emotional meaning by answering simple why questions, which she didn't really, but the one thing I would say is, you know, when she said no Band-Aid, and I think I might have said, well, why not? Because she needs the cream first. So that was the highest she got at that level six there. And then I'm not going to go into these for lack of time, but these are much higher level goals. They're very, very self-explanatory. We use a data collection book um, to keep track of all of these things. Again, you can take a look at this for yourself, um, but just to talk about how we organize. And if you're ever interested, you can email me and I'll share, which is now all on Google Docs, how we do this so kids don't even have program books anymore. They have program folders on Google Docs that we all contribute to. And the Google Forms are really nice because rather than just being a document that you write, there's actual spaces that you fill in and it gets people to be so much more compliant and taking notes and data because if for whatever reason, these little forms, you know when you get the evite, how easy it is, it's, it, it lends itself to that level of ease. Um, these, are, these are just giving some examples of year-long IEP goals. Um, which look a lot different now. We use Real Time, which is an online program, which a lot of IEP people do, so it looks ugly like this now. And then you have a sample data sheet in your handouts, but I also made some over here. And we'll see if we have time. This just really talks about um, monitoring, assessing, and adapting. You all sound extremely experienced, and those of you watching it out there can read this for yourself. Um, just the process of data collection, how often we look at it, how we average it, and so forth. IEP meetings, most of you already know, held once a year. Um, this is now. So let, I wanted to see, we were gonna practice um, doing a data sheet with another video, but let me just at least get through the last couple of slides. Um, if we have time, we'll get back to it, but I think we have done a lot of process, I mean, practicing and, and looking at these videos. So again, just working with staff, this is wrapping up, rolling up your sleeves, get involved, demonstrate, acknowledge your own challenges, identify what works, stay positive, balance critique and praise, respect for the existing program, show respect for individual teaching styles, <coughs> respect the pace at which you're able to implement these programs and train people and work as a team. Um, you know, this talks a little bit about evaluating the effectiveness of the program. And just remembering that this is a work in progress. Build your program in steps. Meet challenges with an open mind. Make changes to the program and IEP as needed. And stay creative and positive and main, maintain strong alliances with your team. If you use DIR with the adults first, you're going to get so much farther for that child. So just please, um, I know it's hard. It's hard work, whether you're a parent or a professional, trying to get this work into schools. And sometimes it feels like you're climbing Mount Everest. but. Um, Try to stay DIR in frame of mind and you'll, you'll, you will make change. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much for being very attentive. <laughs>